hanging up their hats. It's very sad, it's gut-wrenching. Hazelwood workers clock off for the last time. And keeping the lights on. This is a mechanical and it is an electronic system and it is, it is subject to, um, to, to breakage and faults. And if they occur, there will be risks about blackouts. Just how secure are Victoria's power supplies? Good evening, Ian Henderson with a special hour-long edition of ABC News. Well, after months of preparations, workers at the Hazelwood Power Station are tonight clocking off for the last time. Earlier this week, on Wednesday, the last of its eight generators were switched off. And now the only tasks remaining are the gradual decommissioning of the plant and the rehabilitation of the open-cut mine. Ben Knight has watched the day unfold at Hazelwood and joins us now. Ben, a sad day for workers there. Only when you talk to some of the workers who have just clocked off for the final shift, Ian, do you really get a sense of just how sad it is. Of course, they are heading off into an incredibly uncertain future. This was a job that many of them thought would last them another 10 years. Those who could see the writing on the wall expected that there would be at least another three. It didn't happen that way, of course. This was a sudden shutdown. And today, as they drive out of this car park for the last time, they'll be driving off to mortgages, school fees, car payments, insurance, all of those things that they really don't know how they're going to be able to pay unless they find another job. And they don't believe they're going to be able to find another job here. The town of Morwell, of course, will someone describe the mood in town today as being like a memorial. It felt that way. People were buying flowers in shops and bringing them down here in shop windows in Morwell. You saw signs up saying, thank you, Hazelwood, for the past 50 years. Of course, it's going to have an impact there. From the commercial laundry, who's just lost $300,000 worth of business a year from washing the clothes of the workers here. This goes far beyond. The workers themselves, they're angry, they're disappointed and because they expected and wanted more of a transition for themselves. They say this wasn't planned for, this should have been seen coming, that they should have been given something else to go to. But they also know, they say that the impact of this goes far beyond them, it goes far beyond Morwell, it goes to the state, it goes to the nation. And they say that if this is not going to be the last coal-fired power station to close down, and clearly it won't, that it can't happen this way again. That when the other stations close down, they need to be planned for. And it's interesting that there was a Senate report tabled in Parliament this week which said pretty much exactly that, that the transition away from coal is happening, not just based on what's happening with energy policy in Australia, but based on what's happening in China and India with the age of the coal-fired power stations in Australia. What's going to happen if Australia is to meet its, its, uh, its climate emissions targets under the Paris Agreement? All of these things mean that the transition away from coal is on and it needs to be planned for much better than it is so that it can be done at the lowest possible cost to consumers, to workers, to taxpayers and of course to communities like this. And today is all about the workers here at Hazelwood. My colleague Jean Edwards has spent the day with them and spoken to many of them as they clocked off for the final time. Hazelwood's workers hang up their hats and a final farewell to 50 years of powering the state. The plant's fence morphed into a message board with a floral tribute to staff at the coalface. I've uh, worked about 36 years here. I'm 51 years of age uh, and it's very sad and <laughs> thank you people but yeah, I, I don't want to break down anymore, okay? Dave Johnson is a third generation power industry worker and father of three. It's a, a sort of livelihood and to be pulled out underneath you with minimal notice is sort of pretty hard, you know, you've got family commitments and you know, loans and mortgages and all the rest of it so yeah, you just have to try and struggle on and do the best you can. In some ways, it, you know, it's, it's a relief that now, you know, the axe has finally fallen, it's not hanging over your head anymore and, and they can get on with the next phase of their lives. Some came armed with photos and fond memories. That's us, yeah. Yeah, that's all our work group. Yeah, just something to hang up in the shed, look at it now and again. Yeah, a bit of a tear in the eye. In a nod to all things electrical, an ACDC cover band camped in the car park. Let me be light. Let me be light. But some former staff were upset they weren't allowed into the company's farewell lunch, despite working at Hazelwood for decades. 
terrible because it's like you never worked here. Um, because I haven't got any current swipe card to get in the gate, uh, I feel like I'm an imposter. French energy giant Engie made the decision to shut the ageing power station last November, dismissing calls for a staged shutdown. When you do a phase closure, let's say we reduce only half, we still have a lot of fixed cost which is existing within the mine and within the power station, which makes it even less economical to be able to run. The decision leaves 750 people out of a job, including keen gardener Ron Bernardi, who's worked at the mine for 35 years. He says he's ready to go and has some advice for his younger workmates. Don't waste your time when you earn your income. Don't spend it on you know fast boats and fast cars. Focus on your uh, um, what's important in your life and uh, at the end of it, maybe you can retire and not look for a job that's just like me. <laughs> but for Hazelwood's young workforce, the job hunt goes on. Jean Edwards, ABC News, Morwell. Before it shut down, the Hazelwood power station generated about a fifth of Victoria's electricity output. Hazelwood and the Latrobe Valley's other coal-fired generators, Yalorn and Loy Yang, accounted for 86% of the state's power. Wind, water and gas generation made up the remaining output. With Hazelwood, Victoria could produce more electricity than it needed and exported surplus power to neighbouring states through four interconnectors. Without it, Victoria will now rely on those other states to top up its supply at times of peak demand. So what happens next summer if there's a heat wave in southeastern Australia? Will there be enough power to go around? The Australian energy market operator is confident existing gas and coal-fired plants can produce more electricity and the system will cope. But some industry analysts warn that if an interconnector fails or a big power station can't meet its targets, Victoria will be at greater risk of blackouts. Robin Powell explains. When South Australia was plunged into darkness in September last year, it kicked off a nationwide blame game. At the centre of it was the Australian energy market operator over its failure to bring enough generators into the system in time to prevent a statewide blackout. Experts say AEMO has a lot to improve on. The way it makes sure that it doesn't repeat, I would say, some of the errors of last summer and the way it makes sure that we don't have an awful situation where people are without power and yet there are generators not running, that has to be avoided. The errors of summer weren't just in South Australia. The February heatwave in New South Wales caught AEMO short as well, when several gas-fired generators either failed under pressure or couldn't start at all. This is a mechanical and it is an electronic system and it is, it is subject to, um, to, to breakage and faults and if they occur there will be risks about blackouts. AEMO's solution to the February crisis was to tell New South Wales power users to cut back. Its last resort plan was to cut power to Ballarat and Bendigo, outraging Victoria's energy minister. Next summer will be even tougher to manage. With Hazelwood now off the grid, so too go 1,600 megawatts of power. It's predicted that on at least 50 days of high temperature and high demand, there'll be a shortfall of between 200 and 500 megawatts. South Australia's Pelican Point power station is coming back online in July to pick up the slack, and the market operator hopes to use power stations at Swan Bank in Queensland and the Tamar Valley in Tasmania. Can you guarantee people that you will get these online early enough so we don't have a repeat of what happened last time? So we can't guarantee it. Having said that, what we can guarantee is that we will be working with the market participants and the jurisdictions as hard as we can to fulfil our goal of providing a reliable supply for the people of Australia. But much of Australia's energy technology is old and not always reliable. If things get tight, more drastic measures could be needed, like cutting back power. We also have other mechanisms like a reserve trader where we can look at moving some of the, in the, the large consumers and their load to, to off-peak. As the shift to renewables intensifies, there are more questions about AEMO's ability to cope. How do we make sure now that AEMO uh, follows uh, the rules in a way that is more consistent with the challenges of a grid, which is very different from the grid we had only two or three years ago, let alone 10 years ago. And we'll be different again in 10 years' time. And in the constant face of change, keeping the lights on will be a challenge. 
Robin Powell, ABC News, Melbourne. For 50 years, Hazelwood's eight giant smokestacks were a symbol of Victoria's powerhouse in the La Trobe Valley. I visited as a schoolboy soon after it was built in the 60s and there was a palpable sense of pride in its, for then, state-of-the-art technology. But as this potted history explains, much has changed since. The first of Hazelwood's eight electricity generators came online in 1964. It was built to meet the demands of Victoria's post-war population boom and drive the state's growing manufacturing industry. The boiler is about as big as a city office building. This one, the main one, is capable of lighting a ring of street lamps around the world. By 1971, it was generating nearly half of Victoria's electricity and had brought thousands of new workers and their families to the La Trobe Valley. The valley's massive reserves of brown coal promised cheap power into the next century. Environmental concerns were secondary at best, even in the 1980s. We're very bullish at the moment. We think the prospects for further expansion are very high indeed. That expansion came to a halt in 1992 with privatisation. But Hazelwood kept chugging along. When a private consortium bought the plant in 1996, there were plans to keep it going for another 30 years, well beyond its planned lifespan. <coughs> Environmental groups were outraged. The tide was turning. This is the most polluting power station in the industrialised world. It's 1960s technology. The Brax Labor government brokered an extraordinary deal to keep Hazelwood going, diverting the course of the Morwell River to open up new brown coal reserves. In exchange for a guarantee, Hazelwood would cut its carbon emissions. We took some time over this to get it right and to get the best possible environmental outcome we could. But calls for Hazelwood's closure were getting louder. A fire in the open-cut mine in 2014 all but sealed Hazelwood's fate. Finally, in November last year, its French owners announced the power station was no longer a viable business and will be closed for good. Still ahead in this ABC News special, voting with their feet. The massive shift to solar that's already underway in Victoria and why power companies are worried. And years of promises and big ideas come to nothing. Why is it so hard to find a new industry for the valley's massive brown coal reserves? For example, converting our brown coal into carbon fibre. Carbon fibre is worth something like $20,000 a tonne. The value add is huge. Why haven't we got a carbon pitch plant in La Trobe Valley? Also, we speak to the Premier, Daniel Andrews. All that later yep. in the program. Returning now to the closure of the Hazelwood power station, we're going to take a closer look at the implications for Victoria's energy security and the economy of the Latrobe Valley. Valley. First, energy. Even before news of Hazelwood's closure, Victorians were already reducing their dependence on the electricity grid by installing their own solar power. 1.6 million Victorian homes and businesses now produce their own electricity from rooftop solar systems. And with power bills expected to rise even further and the arrival of affordable battery storage systems, many more are expected to do the same over the next few years. But as Ben Knight reports, that could create more problems than it solves. It was about a year ago that David Wakefield finally decided his business was paying too much for electricity. We had a power bill that was uh, approaching 90,000 per annum. His lift factory in Moi uses a lot of it. But just as his business was taking off, so too were power prices. Every time we looked at the amount of power we needed, we actually found, well, we need a bit more. The solution they decided on was solar a 130 kilowatt system installed on the roofs of their two factory buildings. Instead of paying 30 plus cents per kilowatt hour, it's free. How long before this system pays for itself? Four years at electricity prices being what they are, but the way they're rising, it might be less. And power prices are, of course, rising. 
the wholesale price of electricity was already climbing fast before the carbon tax spiked it even higher in 2013. When the carbon tax was repealed two years later, prices did dip, but they were still double what they'd been a decade before. In the coming year, the average household bill in Victoria is expected to rise by another $100, before easing slightly the year after. Compare that with the cost of rooftop solar, which has tracked continuously down. There are now more than one and a half million rooftop solar systems in Victoria. And the biggest take up by far has been in Melbourne's outer rim suburbs. Early on when solar first was being rolled out, it was, it was expensive and so it was only, uh, you know, the sort of inner urban uh, wealthier suburbs that were taking it up. But as it's time's gone on, the cost has come down and I think the anxiety about electricity prices has increased, then actually we've seen it in more the mortgage belt areas where, where solar's been the, been the big take up. And in the country, Andrew McCarthy installed the solar system at David Wakefield's Moe factory, and he's seen the explosion in demand for solar firsthand. Four years ago, he had just four employees. Now, he has 25. Uh, we had about a 70% um, increase last year in the demand. Um, it's probably tracking for 100% this year. He says battery technology will be the next game changer. I think the technology is emerging very quickly, certainly faster than I uh, thought it would. I think people will still stay connected to the grid um, and use it as a backup for the days where, you know, they have high usage in winter, for example. Um, but certainly it's being used as more of a, a backup to the renewables rather than the other way around. But staying connected to the grid costs money even for people who are producing their own power, like David Wakefield, which is why he's doing the numbers right now on installing a battery system. So your plan is to completely remove yourself from the grid? If the economics dictate and it looks as if they're moving in that way, we will do that eventually for sure. The idea of a stampede off the grid worries the power industry deeply. By almost any measure, that seems like a fail to us because um, there are enormous benefits in sharing the cost of a grid and if we start having customers at scale exiting the grid while living in the middle of it, that tells us that something is materially wrong. Um, it will, if that happens, transfer those costs of the network onto those customers who can't afford those expensive power stations. Who in turn will be less willing to pay and will be looking to get off the grid as well. There's a term for it. It's called the death spiral. The way we use that grid's going to change. And the real trick, I think, is going to how do you balance the economic efficiency of the grid versus the short-term economic benefit of reducing your dependence on the grid. And the way the grid's priced um, is going to be a central part of that, and that becomes a very complex issue for both governments and regulators. Andrew McCarthy says the grid will change, but for the better. So we've seen over the last 50 years there's been a very centralised approach where you generate all the power in one facility and then you distribute it all the way around the grid. That's the most expensive part of, of the electricity uh, network. Um, so if we can decentralise that and we can have more solar and renewable energy on people's homes and businesses and they can actually produce power at the point where they're using it, um, I think there's a remarkable uh, benefit first of all for the homeowner or the business owner, but secondly for the electricity grid when you have to send the power less distance to where it's needed. But that could take decades. And in the meantime, of course, the system still needs the kind of baseload electricity that comes from thermal power stations like Hazelwood. The problem is that with no clear direction on climate or emissions policy, the private power companies are holding back on building any new power stations to replace them. Instead, governments find themselves in the remarkable position of getting back into the business of building power stations. But when governments step in, private investors step out. What you could see is with those announcements is the rest of the investment community sit back and go, we'll wait and see what happens with those investments if they proceed when they're ready before we would commit to anything further. And that's always the risk. In any scenario, the era of cheap power in Victoria is over. The question is, is that permanent? Well, the guts of it is, this is going to be a, a journey that's going to cost money. The cost of energy is going to go up, both for businesses and for households. The reality is we are seeing higher power prices now, and I think they are locked in for a number of years ahead. But uh, we can make new investments in things like renewable energy and battery storage quite quickly. The quicker we do that, then the quicker we can expect those power prices to start to come back down again. 
while more and more people like David Wakefield are choosing not to wait and are going their own way. We need to insulate ourselves from as many threats as possible. Uh, power costs are one of them and we can do something about it and that's why we elected to. Ben Knight reporting there. Well, down in the Latrobe Valley, there's a sense of here we go again. The region is still recovering from the privatisation of the power industry in the 90s when thousands of people lost their jobs. Now, Hazelwood has closed and there's been very little time to prepare. People are hoping for the best but fearing the worst and are frustrated at the lack of specifics in the government response so far. But it's not all doom and gloom down in the valley. As Kelly Lazaro reports, some local business operators are optimistic and say the region will bounce back. If the Latrobe Valley is supposed to be down and out, no one told Lizzie Maskell. She opened this cafe in Newborough just two months ago and says business is good. A four dollar coffee or an, an hour massage or yoga session that people are still spending and wanting to be a part of their community. She went ahead even after hearing of Hazelwood's closure. How are you, Jen? Good, how are you? You can come in, you can try something new, you can fail, you can try again. Um, there is that so much support around. At just 27, this is her second business venture. She also runs a wholesale take-home meals operation she started two years ago. It's so important to invest where, in where we are, be proud of where we're from and to try and display that as well as we can, especially when times are tougher. Builder Ben Tyler is also optimistic. The valley was feeling a little stale, but the vibe now is just go, go, go. He says the fear and uncertainty about the closure have been worse for the local economy than the shutdown itself. It's just let's make something happen and we're exploring all these new ideas and new technologies, whether they be coal based, whether they be forestry, whether they be agriculture. Um, I think it's just got everyone's mind ticking. When the news broke of Hazelwood's closure, the state and federal governments scrambled to respond, kicking in $300 million to help cushion the blow. $50 million is going towards subsidies and tax breaks for new and expanding businesses. There's $85 million to upgrade sporting facilities. But people here have seen governments throw money around before. Various entities around the place pork barrel this money, they take this money. And yes, it might be good to get a $46 million swimming pool, but it will not change the economic fundamentals of the Trobe Valley. G'day Ray, how are you? G'day Cheryl, how you doing, Dom? Cheryl Ragg is a long-time community activist. She says there have been plenty of great ideas for new industries, but nothing has materialised. For example, converting our brown coal into carbon fibre. Carbon fibre is worth something like $20,000 a tonne. The value add is huge. Why haven't we got a carbon pitch plant in Latrobe Valley? We don't because we don't have any body, we don't have a commission enshrined in legislation to make that happen. She's critical of projects like this, a $1 million renovation of the art gallery at Morwell. Kylie White is the acting head of the Latrobe Valley Authority, whose job it is to work out how to spend the state government's money. She rejects the accusation of pork barrelling. Many of the uh, projects that we're working on now have been those that have been discussed or been in the pipeline or considered uh, for the region uh, up until now. So now it's the chance to get those underway and then look to what's next. But what is next? No one from the authority or the government seems to know. Hazelwood won't be the last of the Latrobe Valley's power stations to shut down. Others will follow. For decades, people here have listened as politicians and bureaucrats talk about a transition. There have been task forces, things have been built and beautified, yet there's still no clear idea of what that transition is or where it's supposed to be headed. At town meetings like this, there's more scepticism about how the money is being spent. 16,000 bucks for a business plan. The guy's run a successful business for 25 years. He doesn't need a business plan. This money that's being handed out, taxpayers' dollars, what we really need to keep track of it. Harriet Shing is a local state Labor MP. She says this time it will be different. We've had millions committed over the years uh, with promises to turn coal into diamonds. It hasn't translated into real jobs on the ground. 
As of tomorrow, hundreds of those real jobs are needed for former Hazelwood workers. Some will be kept on to decommission the plant and rehabilitate the mine. Some may get jobs at other power plants like Loy Yang, but many, like Troy Makepeace, feel misled. He signed on with Hazelwood three years ago on a promise that the plant would still be running until at least 2025. You confident you'll get a job? I have to be. <laughs> um, yes, I am. Um, where, when and how, I don't know. That's, that's what scares me the most. He and his wife, Mars, finished building this house weeks before the announcement the plant would shut. His redundancy payout equates to about three months' pay. We've gone on a massive roller coaster emotion-wise to uh, one day you know, accepting the keys to a house you've just spent two years, over two years in putting together to three weeks later thinking, I can't believe we made that decision. Why did we do it? And that sucks because it's something we've worked so hard for. Mars has been through this before. Her dad was one of the thousands of power workers who lost their jobs when the State Electricity Commission was sold off in the 90s. Now I can understand why my dad was talking about moving away and taking the family and, you know, things like that. But, um, but then he just got a job elsewhere, which was really lucky, but it took him a long time, you know. Didn't feel protected by the government then, don't feel protected by the government now. Ben Tyler believes it will happen for people like Troy. Do you hope this is a bit of a turning point for this region? You could look at the loss of the jobs or you could look at there's 700 skilled trades now available. What can we do with them? And uh, let's make use of this opportunity. We need factories, we need businesses, we need industries that will get people off the streets and back into productive work before another of the Valley's big coal-fired power plants shuts down too. That report from Kelly Lazaro. Well, the decision to shut Hazelwood wasn't the state government's, but it still has to manage the consequences of the closure, the loss of jobs and energy security. So what is the transition plan for the Latrobe Valley? Earlier, I sat down with the Premier, Daniel Andrews, to ask him just that. If this were easy, then it may well have occurred many, many decades ago. It probably needed to. I can't change that. All I can do is work as hard as possible with my team to grow jobs uh, and to grow investment and to make sure that there are more options, more choices for families right across the Latrobe Valley. One of the ways we're doing that, there are incentives for businesses that are only on offer in that region. People appreciate the, the, the good intentions, but what people are saying to us is a degree of frustration that there, there are no specifics yet that we can't, you know, what they're saying is we need a couple of big employers. Can you give us an idea about who they might be? There have been many, many schemes talked about for many years. I'm really conscious because locals have told me the last thing they want is another sort of get rich quick scheme, another, another thing that might stack up on paper but never actually delivers the real jobs that they so desperately need. So yes, I'm more than happy to support and we are supporting a number of different uh, ideas. Uh, but I don't want to be out there giving people false hope. I, it is difficult, you, but you've got to be, I think, in my judgment, absolutely straight with people. Uh, none of these options are proved up at the moment. None of them are going to deliver hundreds or thousands or perhaps any jobs anytime soon. But we'll continue working on them and there are some good prospects there. But I think it's much more important to be, to be straight with people and to say, look, we'll do the work, but there's no... There's no magic wand when it comes to other uses for coal. OK, well, can, I, can I just chase that hear. rabbit down the, the hole a little f further? Sure. More broadly, do you think coal has a future? Coal will remain a significant part of our energy mix for many years to come. Uh, now, uh, some people are surprised to hear me say that. It's a fact. Those jobs are important. That, that baseload output is important. Uh, this is going to be a, fe a feature of our energy production uh, for a good long while. Premier, turning now to the question of uh, energy security, can you guarantee industry and householders that there won't be blackouts next summer? I'm not diminishing the difficulties involved in Hazelwood's closure, uh, nor am I saying that people are not allowed to have a different view. But the market operator is very clear about what our prospects are for security of electricity supply uh, for many, many years to come. OK, you'd want to be sure of that, though, coming into an election year, wouldn't you? Because a blackout would be a very bad look. Well, look, these are things are not about whether it's election year. 
every year these issues are very important and that's why we take them very seriously. We have an energy uh, task force as part of the Victorian Cabinet. We're looking at a whole range of different settings and places where we might make uh, really important investments to, to be certain. To can be I ask you what, what are some of those options? I mean, you've, you've mentioned the battery storage, yes. but are there other things the state can look at to sort of shore up its position? I think batteries are probably at the top of anybody's list, and we see that not just in Victoria or in other, other Australian states, but right uh, across the world. This technology is changing really fast. Uh, they cost a certain amount today. That cost is coming down almost every uh, week as technology improves, I think battery storage is going to be a significant part of our energy mix into the future. If high prices are sort of driving people to batteries and solar rigs, uh, won't grid electricity be even more expensive for those that remain, presumably low income people who can't afford those rigs? What's the way forward? Well, I think there are many people who are coming to the view, whether it's just ordinary householders, those in business or policy makers and experts in, the, in this field that are coming to the view that the national electricity market is not working. And this I think is a point that, that should be driving a national conversation, and, and not one that goes for years, in quick time we should be having a proper adult debate, not throwing political insults at, at each other, but instead saying we've all, we're all in this together, we've all got a stake in this, let's, let's tap some of those, uh, you know, the best people in the world many of whom are located in the energy sector right here in Victoria. And let's work with them at a national level to fix the clear deficiencies in a national electricity market that's just not working. Premier, thanks very much for your time. Thanks very much, Ian.